Riding shotgun refers to the practice of sitting next to the driver in a moving vehicle. The term riding shotgun came around after the time of the stagecoach when somebody used to sit next to the driver holding a shotgun in case they ran into bandits. My name is Charlie Cook and I drive a lot. I like to talk to people while I'm driving, so I interview people in my car while I'm driving. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. All right, before we start today's Riding Shotgun with Charlie, I do wanna say that I have been looking at the analytics on the YouTube and I have more new people watching the show that are not subscribers. So if you are here and you're watching the show, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. For the people that are coming back, thanks for coming back. I love that you guys are here and I appreciate you guys and watch the show and enjoy the show. If you'd like to help support the show, there's a couple things you can do. You can ride some, uh, you can buy some Riding Shotgun with Charlie and some Gungram stickers and you can find those at the writingshotgun.com, sorry, writing shot, I don't even know my website, writingshotgunwithcharlie.com website, and uh, and go to the shop page. So if you uh, if you do that, that'd be great. You can also buy some t-shirts and hoodies and mugs there as well. So thank you very much. Thanks for being here, and thanks for supporting the show. All right, so welcome to this episode of Writing Shotgun with Charlie. Today we are coming at you from Dallas, Texas, and I have the world famous historian. <laughs> Ashley Lubinsky. Ashley, thank you so much for being oh, on the show. Thanks for having me. I don't uh, know if I you do a handshake <laughs> in a car. <laughs> right. You gotta do it, man. All right, so we are um we're at Dallas for Amcon and we're sneaking away. And we're going to gonna go to a very historical place. Which I can't wait for. Because I believe everything. What I, I love every show on the Kennedy assassination and whatever it is that the show is pushing, I believe. You know, what's interesting is I love uh, true crime and all yeah. the UFO stuff and ghost stuff and whatever. And, and the reality is I really haven't seen... Texas 114 East. Don't try to kill us. We're, we're going the wrong way here. Oh. It's a good thing this is a rental. <laughs> and not your rental. We have the insurance and we're not afraid to use it. Yep. And it's not <laughs> under your name, so you're fine. Right. Oh, by the way, I want to thank Cheryl Todd from <laughs> Gun Freedom Radio for letting us use her stagecoach. Uh, you should check them out, Gun Freedom Radio and Pot of Gold uh, auctions. So we'll, we'll put some links for them. So anyways, yeah, so I, I love all of that stuff. Like I've been, I binge watch like so many murder shows, it's not even funny. Yeah. Um, but then I don't actually think I know too much about the, the conspiracies behind the Kennedy assassination. Like I think I did when I was younger because my dad's really into it. Yeah. But I really don't know a ton of them. But all I do right. know that the Carcano rifle is not where we're going. Right. And that the government plays a real shady role in most of the history from this time period. We're going to talk about okay. that later. Which is a conspiracy theory, but <laughs> <laughs> I have There's a conspiracy theory for the conspiracy? <laughs> exactly. No, sir. No, sir. All right. Let's talk about you and how you became, um, you're, you've like, you, you, you make gun history cool and fun and <laughs> hip. Thank you. And I, dare I say sexy? Um, most of the gun historians you've seen are on the Outdoor Channel, and they're old. They look hey, like I'm me. on the Outdoor Channel. I said most. Okay. Up until you, most of the guys we've seen on the, doing doing gun history are um, guys that make me look thin, and um, guys that make me look young. That is so accurate. <laughs> it's not even funny. But you know what's funny about that though is that I identify as an old middle-aged white guy. So it's okay. the same thing. Yeah. Identify as a young hot white chick. There so, go. Well, this is awkward. There we go, right? <laughs> I didn't know. We do, I don't know how to do one of those face swaps, but that'd be kind of funny. That would be it creepy as hell, it but. Really would be. <laughs> <laughs> as pink your color? Uh, no. Black is my color because it's slimming. I like black. I, I danced in New York City for you know most of my childhood, so That's we wear a lot of black. That's um, 
actually when I moved to Arizona, which is where I live now, my stepdaughter, like back when she was eight, uh, was always like, why do you wear so much black? Because like in Arizona, that's not a thing. Right, it sucks having <laughs> all the heat. Yeah, well, I mean, I still wear it to this day, but I've added obviously color into my re repertoire, so. It's always good stuff. Expanding my horizons. All right, so tell you are, you're a uh, historian, you've been everywhere, you've given lectures, you've, you've testified in front of Congress, you've done all sorts of really yeah. amazing things for a, um, a young person? I'm not that young. Okay. I mean, I am, but I'm not. Okay. I'm in my 30s. All right. So when you're my age, 30 is young. Okay. Okay. All right. So <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, how does uh, how do you, how do you get it? How did you become a gun historian? How did you get to this point? So I wanted to be a doctor because that's how all those stories start, right? <laughs> right. Uh, I remember I did an interview with Ted Koppel years ago, and when we were off camera, I was he asked me the same question, and he was like, "So what made you want to do this?" And I was like, "Well, you know, I wanted to be a doctor. I studied battlefield medicine. Um, I was really interested in like the evolution of weapons technology and ammunition technology and how that affects, you know, how medicine was practiced on the battlefield and what they learned from each war." Uh, moving forward and so he was like real interested in it and we had this great conversation and then when we got on camera he asked me the same question and I was like well I wanted to be a doctor so I got queued up and then he interrupts me and goes so you went from wanting to save lives to things that take them and what <laughs> and let me, let me, double okay. Okay. so let me also say that he's wonderful and was so good to me and actually couldn't use the footage because like, he tried to get me to say stuff for like an hour and a half and oh he came up God. to me like we were at something a couple days later and he's like listen he's He's like, I gotta be honest with you. He's like, uh, you're not gonna appear in this segment because I couldn't get you to say anything that I uh, needed you to say. So he's that like, so dirty dog. But you know what? He was like, I loved him. Like I had the greatest time. I learned. I sweat a lot during it because it was like, it was totally the like. We totally went on a tangent, but in the uh, in the interview at one point, he was like, he asked me something about the politicization of the gun, and I said, especially back when I was 23, I was like, I don't. You know, I'm not a political historian, I, I don't speak to that. Right. And so then when we were on B-roll, to a B-roll, he was like, well, okay, so I know you can't speak on the record, but like, what do you really think? And I was still on microphone, and I was like, I'm thinking we're on B-roll, and I'm still on microphone, so I'm right. good, you know? Uh, all, and then, all mics are always hot. And then as soon as we packed all the gear up and stuff, I started randomly talking about something that answered his question. He goes, so you did know? <laughs> and I was like, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, I wanted to be a doctor, and I went from wanting to save lives to studying things that can be used to take them. Um, and so... My background uh, is really, I, when I say it, it's a macro historical approach. Uh, so I look at all of gun history and yeah. I, I know more about some areas than others, but I look at kind of how the evolution has changed, um, how it stayed the same, and how that impacts you know larger conversations on industry, technology, society, culture, uh, all that. And I am personally a big uh, dark tourism fan, so I do a lot with crime history. Um, mm. And like right now, two of my clients are the LA Police Museum and the Bob Museum. So uh, personally, I'm more fascinated by guns used in crime and how to interpret them than guns not used in crime. What do you mean how to interpret them? So a lot of gun museums in the past have been by the collector for the collector. And there are a lot of collectors who don't believe in collecting artifacts uh, or guns specifically that have been used in crimes. Okay. Uh, they, and that's, you know, because they don't want people to think about firearms as negative. Um, and so they just don't collect those things. And so one of the things that I always used to say when I ran the Cody Firearms Museum was, uh, you know, firearm, throughout firearms history, you know, there are a lot of stories to be told. And violence is a part of that story, but it's only one part. So you know, I always try to couch it if I'm dealing with people that don't know about overall gun history, that like there's so much more and violence is like this little part of it, but it's, you know, but it is a part and to yeah. ignore it, I don't think is fair. Right, so, doesn't, doesn't do it justice. Yeah, so because a lot of the collectors uh, don't collect that kind of stuff, or didn't, uh, a lot of the gun museums are full of prototypes, you know, never used models, uh, sporting arms, and you yeah. don't get a lot of that. And so you get uh, a lot of the gun displays either being sterilized, or then you get museum people who don't like guns, and then they're taking, you know, a sporting arm and putting it in a case about, like, murder. You know, and it's a sporting arm that, you know, never was used in that situation. Right. So I've really worked um, in my research and my personal passions looking at kind of that like in between of like what happens when you get the artifact that's associated with something incredibly violent or incredibly traumatizing. How do you go about 
telling that story to the public, yeah. um, letting them engage with it, assuming that they all have different viewpoints, experiences that they're bringing into it, and then how do you display it without sterilizing it, and how do you display it without, you know, really playing into the macabre of it all. Uh, I don't think sometimes the macabre of it all is fine, but, you know, so I really, that's kind of where I've ended up kind of in. Yeah, I love it. It's, I like creepy stuff. <laughs> A lot of creepy stuff. That is, uh, that is really cool. Yeah. That is really cool. Uh, you were saying you went from wanting to be a doctor to being a history major. Yeah. Um, how did, how did that go over well with the family? Uh, so my mom's a physics teacher. <laughs> right. So, yeah. You're gonna go from hey, you get this career where you could potentially make, make a bunch money. of money to a career where you're like hey, listen. Um, just because you have a summer vacation doesn't mean you're going on vacation. Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> I did every internship on the planet. Yeah, uh, yeah it didn't go over super well. I mean, my mom knew I was getting interested in this kind of stuff, but yeah. she didn't, you know, she wanted to make sure I had a job. And, and history majors don't always have jobs when they graduate. Or, and you usually have to go through a uh, additional degree. Right. Um, so I, when I wanted to be a doctor when I was a kid, I did everything I could, you know, I was shadowing surgeons, I was reading all of the books and everything to prepare myself for this, so when I, when I decided I wanted to be a history major, I was like, oh crap, like now I have all this knowledge <laughs> that's not relevant, but then I have all this knowledge I need to get in order to be up to where I was on the same, you know, on the same playing field that I was if I had wanted to be going pre-med. Yeah. And so I just did everything I could, so I did every internship on the planet. Um, I volunteered, I researched, I learned how to shoot, I like did everything I could uh, in the rest of my undergraduate undergraduate experience to get the knowledge that was needed to even consider studying firearms. And ultimately it culminated in uh, getting hired by the Smithsonian my senior year of college and doing the Smithsonian wow. between my senior year and my uh, first year of graduate school and then kind of going there uh, spring, fall, uh, so basically during semesters I would take the train in from Delaware um, and then I would work and then I would take the train back and as long as it wasn't Friday and President Biden <laughs> and Vice President Biden wasn't going home, right? we didn't have an issue, it wasn't an issue uh, but back. they would they would delay the Amtrak, <laughs> they would delay the, plan, the trains. Um, so yeah, so I it just all, I just did everything I could, I didn't, I wasn't picky, I just learned as much as I could and then yeah. I stumbled, I honestly stumbled into an internship at the Smithsonian that turned into a three year opportunity. That's crazy. Yeah. At, as a senior in college? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Well, and so actually, the way that that ended up was pretty funny. Um, I just found, it, I was looking for museum internships. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the Smithsonian. They wanted, uh, they needed an intern for the botany department of the National Museum of Natural History. I know okay. nothing about plants. I don't know how to keep plants alive. <laughs> um, I still know nothing about plants. Uh, but they wanted some. They wanted interns that would research uh, U.S. expeditions and like what they brought back. And so I was like, well, I can do that. And I remember that the uh, email that I was supposed to put together, the packet I was supposed to put together, said that they wanted someone with a sense of humor. So I don't remember what the joke was, but I told a really bad joke, <laughs> and then I didn't hear from them. Yeah, like, that's like, the, for like nine months. Nine months? That's not good. So they, what I found out was they essentially pulled the the program because they didn't have funding or anything to move forward with it. And then they, yeah. when they brought it back around, they were like, we remembered your application. And I was like, that's awkward. <sighs> uh, so when I was there, I was in natural history. The guns are in American history. and yeah. But I got a Smithsonian email account, yeah. which I used in multiple parts of my career to sure, get where that I was today, good. right? So um, when, you, when I looked at the Smithsonian email account, I, I looked up who was the curator of firearms and I followed the email format for the Smithsonian and I emailed him and I said hey uh, I'm really interested in studying firearms can I meet with you he said sure and um, I I went into the American History Museum before it opened and I was wearing I had blonde hair I was wearing a sundress and like four inch hot pink stilettos that is a great way to get a job <laughs> yeah. I mean, not that I would know. Yeah. But, uh. So, so I, you know, I go in, and I don't know, I was, uh, not to get too far off topic, but I was definitely in the skin turn category of DC interns. Oh, my. Uh, which is that we didn't know that our, you know, skirts were too short and we we're still wearing our makeup from the night before. Uh, not, that sounded really like sex, but I meant like just drinking. Right. <laughs> that sounded bad. Um, anyway, so I, um, I'm in the lobby and they call the curator and he comes down and he walks down and he looks right at me and I'm the only one in the lobby. Like it's not open. And he walks past me. Oh my God. And, and like, I like, damn, Dave 
Oh yeah. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm Ashley. And he's just like, oh. Like he's just like, what? Um, so we, you know, we had a really good conversation. And he showed me around for a couple of hours, and at the end of it, he said basically that a lot of people want to work, you know, in the gun world in terms of history. Yeah. A lot of people come into the into the gun vault will want to work in the gun vault. Mm -hmm. And he said that I was the only person that he actually thought could do it. And so he would do anything to help me wow. um, get where I was. And so he That's ended awesome. up, he's still a super good friend of mine. Uh, and But it was funny because it was totally that like, I walked in, I looked nothing like I was supposed to look. I was dressed terribly. My choices were terrible uh, for the scenario. But I guess in, in hindsight, you know, everything worked out. Oh, so, yeah. well, that is yeah. well. That is so good. Cool. Yeah, that is so cool. And you parlayed having the I heard you say you parlayed having the Smithsonian yes. email to get a gig at the Cody Museum. Yes. Um, so all right, this is a crazy question. What state do you live in now? I live in Phoenix. Because you, <laughs> you are all every time I see you, you're all over the place. Yeah. You're on some TV show. You're on another podcast. Yeah. You're giving a lecture. You're. I'm in Phoenix now. Man. Um, but I grew up in Pittsburgh. Lived in Delaware for six years. I did undergrad and grad school in Delaware, mm -hmm. and then uh, worked in D.C. during that time period. I lived in Wyoming for almost seven years. I worked in Wyoming for ten years, but I lived there for seven. Um, and now I'm in Phoenix. I've been in Phoenix for a year and a half, wow, two that's years cool. maybe. Yeah. Um, really cool. I prefer Phoenix. I don't yeah. like being cold. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. How do you go? Um, what did you? What does someone do with the Cody Museum? I, like I heard you say, they had, they had several thousand firearms, and they had other firearms that they didn't have out. And yeah, they, what does the museum curator do? <laughs> well, like, do you okay. set up? Like, do you? Are, do you come up with the designs for the displays? Do you? Do you it, have to write all this stuff that we're supposed to read? Yeah, it depends on the museum. So in some okay. museums, a curator is a non-supervisory role. Um, yeah. And you're just the content person. So your okay. job is to be a scholar. Your job is to work on exhibition content, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In Cody, the curator was essentially a director. Okay. Um, so and a curator all at one. Um, so the the Cody is a part of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, and there's mm -hmm. five museums there. So there's a director for the center. Yeah. And then there's the curators for each museum, and that's as high as it goes. So um, sometimes I would say curator in charge of is like a in the in the industry if yeah. you will. Uh, it means that, that you were running the museum and you were just like one of ten curators you know mm -hmm. uh, so as curator in charge of the Cody Firearms Museum I was I ran the museum like so the, the managerial stuff I did the budget I helped write I worked with people to write the grants I fundraised um, I Holy moly. I was yeah I was responsible for you know basically everything. doing everything everything yeah and then that a director would do uh, donor relations, board relations, I had a board, and then I was also a curator, so I was responsible for um, all of the exhibitions, all the content, all the collect we didn't have collections managers, so all the collections management, mm -hmm. um, and then all the educational programming, because our education department did like cross programming um, at the center, so like if you wanted to do it specific for you, you usually were kind of on your own, yeah. and so I did a little bit of everything, and when I, when we rebuilt the museum, I was the project director on that, and I was responsible. I had a team, I had a little team, and then we had other panels that we used of experts. But I mean, I was responsible for everything from managing it, all of the people to um, finding the money, uh, working with our development department to find the money, make the asks, um, and then also write pretty much all the content with uh, Danny, who's now the curator. Yeah. Um, and we had 10,000 objects on display. So uh, we had to write thousands of labels, and we were not on schedule with that. So, like, we had, I, I wrote several thousand labels in like a three to four week period at one point. Wow. Uh, so the labels suck at Cody. That's why. Um, <laughs> we know who, to, who, yeah. who, who it's on. But the thing that I like the most about museum content, and this is what a lot of people either they love or they hate. So when I go to a museum, I don't like to read. I'm not there to read. I'm there to see the stuff. Right. Uh, but I want to have an experience. I'm also there. I'm very much the person that likes going into the immersive experience museum. Uh, a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people like the old style, basically like cabinet of curiosity. Okay. And so I I like to go in and be like, oh my God, I'm in World War II. You know, I want to feel like I'm there. 
Right. Uh, and I don't really want to read a lot. So I, when you are rebuilding a museum, most museums nowadays really don't put that much content out there on the mm -hmm. panels. And some people really don't like that. But uh, there's ways now digitally to provide more information if that's something you want. Um, so for me, I got really good at, uh, and believe it or not, for how much I talk, I got really good at being able to say everything that panel needed to say in a title, everything the panel needed to say in a subtitle, and everything the panel needed to say in the you know actual text. And the text yeah. could be 75 words and that's it. Wow. So like you we we really worked it out. Point. What's yeah, that? You really have to get to the point. Exactly. So, you know, it was really nice because the mindset was, okay, if I just read the title, I need to know what's going on. If I read the subtitle, I can know a little bit more. And if I read the text, I really know what's going on. And so, mm. uh, for me, I think that was my favorite part was like writing the information and synthesizing it so that it wasn't, was still a lot, but it wasn't too much. Wow. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Um, we're in Dealey Plaza. Are we? We are. I, the last I'm time. I'm with the historian and she... I don't know where it is. She's not paying attention to the directions. No, I'm not. I'm too short. I can't see where the dashboard is. Yeah, I haven't been to Dealey Plaza since I was in high school. Okay. I was a speech and debate kid. I was a, what's called a forensicator. I was a forensics, okay. Not like science, but uh, all right. uh, forensic speech and debate. Oh, yeah, here we are. Okay. Sorry. Here oh, we are. Here's yeah, I see the it school now. book depository. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I all thought right. we were going that way. <laughs> no. So while we are here, we, are gonna, we have a red light to... Um, you have so much, oh my god. Um, <laughs> we're gonna talk about how you're a DC project gal. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a DC project gal? Yeah. Diana Mola rocks. Yes, oh my god, she's awesome. You're not even sure, I heard you say on one show, you're like, I don't know, I have so much stuff going on, I don't really know if I'm a DC project girl. Yeah, yeah, I, I sometimes feel like I'm like the worst of the DC project right. women, but. <laughs> she's the slacker. <laughs> I'm the slacker of the group. You know, and for me, it's a really, it's a, it's a different world for me. Right, okay, uh, hold on do you a second. Know, yeah. We are driving, uh oh, let me slow down. We are driving 11 miles an hour over the second X where Kennedy was shot. You guys can't see that dude, huh? Uh, we might have gotten him. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to come back. We're going to get a couple of selfies okay. in front of the school book depository in the grassy knoll because I'm geeky like that. Yeah, no, I'm in. And, and, I, and um, I like morbid stuff, so there you go. Perfect. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we're going to get shots down by the X's. And yeah, then we're going to come back. Pictures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pictures. Mm -hmm. Pictures. 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 Um, we're going to bang a Yui. Okay. I don't know if we're supposed to or not. Random uh, fun fact, which is at the turn of the 20th century, uh, there's a lot to, uh, since we said shots and shots, mm -hmm. uh, photography lingo is based off of firearms lingo and oh it's intentional. Um, and there actually was a, like a like a camera Whoop. gun uh, yeah. at one point. And when Kodak became a thing at the turn of, turn of the 20th century, that's where point shoot, all that came into play. So. I love this. I have a list going on my phone of terms that we use that, that come from uh, Gun come Origins. From gun stuff. There's yeah. a ton of stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my Flash gosh. in the pan. Flash in the pan, pass the buck, all sorts uh, of things. Cool now I can't think of any more. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> well, I'm not going to dig up my phone. Yeah. Um, we're going to, uh, should we park <laughs> illegally for a couple of pictures? Uh, that's up to you. It's not my road, huh? I know, right? I feel like parking illegally is not going to work, but. See what we can do. Uh, we're gonna get some selfies, and when we come back, we are going to talk. We're gonna talk the, the Kennedy assassination because I love the Kennedy assassination. Okay. Oh, you love it? I love it. You I, <laughs> so, I watched. So wait, I gotta inter interrupt you here. This is one of the things about like how we talk about you know mm -hmm. macabre stuff is that like when people are like, oh, I love the Civil War. You know, <laughs> like. Oh. I love when the president was assassinated. Like, doesn't like when you think <laughs> about it, right? Like, doesn't sound right. It does, doesn't sound right. We're like, oh, okay. But I mean, I do it too. But it is just really funny. Right. It's like, ah, oh, I love it's this just... terrible thing that happened. I mean, I don't know where you sit on the spectrum of you know opinion about President Kennedy. You are but... not taking my parking spots. All right. Um, here's here's where I am. I'm going to explain this real quick because time is of the essence here. Uh, here's why I love the uh, the assassination because no one knows and we're never going to know. And I don't think we're ever 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 going to know but I will watch every uh, Kennedy assassination special yeah. on any show and I don't care how many times I watch it whatever whatever agenda they're pushing I believe it yeah like the, I don't know if you saw the one where the guy uh, they said there was a guy in the car in front of him the AR-15 was new they hit the gas he slipped he fell finger on the trigger and that was the final fatal shot you haven't seen this one no I haven't, uh, seen, I haven't seen a lot of them I'm just trying oh to think gosh. about the what year that was in the AR? It wasn't old. 
It was new. Cause it, was, it was pretty new. Yeah, if it would have been brand new, it would have still been like being modified from the Air 10 to the Air 15. And okay, it, now you lost it. Got, <laughs> sorry, it got, it cool. got swallowed up um, by the military so quickly yeah. Um, that you know, it was actually initially meant for the commercial market, but um, because that is a good way, the commercial market's a good way for the military to go. Huh, I want that, mm. and so they they picked it up so quickly. So that's just an interesting choice, I guess. Theoretically, could be. I'm gonna dig re up the historically could be a thing, but I, just I a roll. It's like you know, I think. <laughs> <laughs> this is about as political as you're ever gonna hear me get. I love okay. now, she this is one thing this is one thing she never gets political. Well she's apolitical. I am apolitical as much as you can be, but it is not really political. I just think it's funny, is that like you mentioned the air fifteen, you know, being used to kill uh, Kennedy and I would think if that's true then maybe Diane Feinstein actually does a time traveler. <laughs> <laughs> or was someone else is a time traveler and they went back in time to test out the theory that we shouldn't have these <laughs> things. That's as political as I'm gonna get. Oh my god. I love this. Alright, we'll be back. <laughs> All right, you ready to talk Kennedy? All right, let's talk Kennedy. Let's do it. All right, so we're back. We just took some pictures at the uh, at the school book depository on the grassy knoll and at the two X's on the ground where Kennedy was shot. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't figure out if we should smile or not. We couldn't, so we did both. <laughs> we did both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, as I was saying, I love everything on the Kennedy assassination because I don't think we're ever going to know. But there's some stuff that you know, not that you're revealing who actually killed Kennedy and how no. many shots there were, but the, um, you're a history girl. Yeah. So, so I am not really too well versed in the actual like assassination and all the stuff that you're like really into, and that's just I just didn't come up as a super priority in my work. But that time period you're and everything that's going on. This, yeah, I'm a historian. I don't have to know everything. I know. Right. The one thing I think you should know. <laughs> I'm glad you think that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there is a lot of interesting information about the culture of the time during mm -hmm. this time period. Yeah. Um, and, and I was pointing out that the Carcano rifle that was used in the assassination uh, by Lee Harvey Oswald, if you believe that, uh, is actually <laughs> in the Library of Congress, I believe. Uh, I thought it was right. National Ar Archives, but I think it's the Library of Congress. And you can actually um, look it up, the records on there, the photographs on there. Yeah. There. Um, All right, we're we're, uh, we're gonna slow down to 11 miles an hour, and uh, here is the first X. Boom! Oh, that was the second. One. I missed the <laughs> first one. <laughs> I was like, uh, we're getting on the on ramp. <laughs> <laughs> All right now we hit the gas. Oh my god! I don't know. Okay. Shouldn't you so know about where the X's are if you're yeah. a Kennedy expert? Look, I, I we went over one. I didn't know. Yeah. I'm trying to pay attention to traffic and make sure we don't get hit. I appreciate that. Cheryl would not uh, appreciate it if we get hit in her rental. Or if we hit anybody standing in the X's. Hey, look, if they got it coming, they, there's an X marks the spot. This is where you're supposed to hit them. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, so the, the culture of the time, it, it's a very weird time in American history. Mm -hmm. um, I always call it the post-World War II period because it's really... It goes on for a while, but yeah. um, the Kennedy assassination and Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination and Malcolm X, that all leads into part of the concept of why the Gun Control Act was put, into, yeah, was put yeah. into play in, in 1968. But it's also, depending on where you sit in the conspiracy theory you know, arena, there's a lot going on in that time period in terms of armed radicalism, but then because there's so much armed radicalism, the government starts doing some crazy stuff. Um, the FBI is, you know, literally setting up, a, a, they're assassinating Black Panthers, um, you know, and, and conspiring with various police departments. Um, they're, you know, purposely instigating unrest within, you know, black communities. Uh, they, are, they have people that they pay to go around to different universities. Uh, Tommy the Traveler was one of them. And he would literally teach students about like radicalism, overthrowing the government, how to make bombs. He trained them on M14s, uh, you know, and, and he was wow. being paid by the FBI. 
So, yeah. and this is all happening, and it's not like it's like, ooh, Ashley's making a conspiracy theory. Um, the confidential documents were leaked by an activist um, and sent to the media, which caused a Senate hearing um, about it, and the Senate did find that the FBI employed lawless tactics um, in handling several different things. Um, and it was brutal. I mean, like, when you read those reports, like, they had a one, le one of the letters was like, you know, we want to encourage, you know, creativity in, you know, setting up these, you know, situations and, you know, carrying them through to cause chaos, basically. And, like, to the point where, like, if you had a really good one that worked, like, you were essentially, like, the employee of the month and you got, like, <laughs> celebrated for what you had done. So, I mean, I know it's not Kennedy specifically, but you've got all these people dying and the FBI tried to get Martin Luther King Jr. to kill himself. There was a whole, like, counter tactic there. And so, like, I not... I wouldn't be surprised if it was an inside job because they're doing all kinds of stuff, you know, for the benefit of, I'm not sure who actually, I'm like, you look at this and you're like, why would you do this? I don't understand. Um, but I mean, there's a lot, there's a ton going on in the federal government that's, you know, hella sketch and why not one more thing? Seems like it makes sense. I don't know. That's what about Sinatra's involvement? I have no idea. Oh my gosh. Nope. So, Wait, yeah, there, okay. I, so, yeah, so Sinatra was uh, supposedly Sinatra. Sinatra helped Kennedy get election, elected uh, in Chicago. And so the gangsters in, in Chicago wanted some, some favors. I, be, I believe the gangsters in Chicago wanted some stuff from Kennedy. And uh, somehow Kennedy pissed off uh, Sinatra. Mm. And Sinatra and, and the mob had, mm. uh, had him take care of Well, and isn't there the Marilyn Monroe one, too? Marilyn Monroe theory? Uh, <laughs> no? Dish? That no, uh, maybe Marilyn I mean, Monroe I, I, was, I, Marilyn Monroe was being tag teamed by the uh, by the Kennedy brothers and Sinatra didn't like it? <laughs> I don't know. No, okay. I mean, I, I thought there was something that had to do with Marilyn Monroe and, there, and retribution. Probably. Probably. I mean, probably. yeah. But now I'm just making shit up. I don't know. I thought there was, but maybe there's not. Um, you know what? Here's my interesting Kennedy fact that I did not know. Because everyone's like, mm, John F. Kennedy, he's so sexy, right? Yeah. He was gross. He yeah, had like, like medical teeth. Well, well, he had like medical problems where like he had skin issues and like he was like actually like he was very sickly and he was real gross. Like okay. and that's the accurate historical <laughs> record. He was real gross. <laughs> <laughs> that's an accurate historical <laughs> Can yeah. I get that on record? Yeah, it's, it's real, real gross. gross. But no, like he had like all kinds of like medical issues that made him very unappealing. So it's interesting that like he's gone down in history as like the super attractive, charismatic person. Right. But like he had all of these issues that made him quite off putting. Well, I mean, not well, I'm not talking about like emotional things, but like, you know, medical things that were quite not attractive. Which is also interesting because the whole like televised Nixon Oh, the uh, debate. Kennedy debate where they said, you know, that right. Tom Nixon watched, lost it. If you watched it, yeah. Kennedy won. If you listened to it, it Nixon, Nixon won. won. Right. And it was all about that, like, Nixon was, like, wiping his nose or something. Like, he was doing something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I almost, like, made a Nixon comment. But my, my great uncle by marriage is John Dean. So I got, like, a, I have, like a, a painting from the White House that was given to him that says Merry Christmas from the Nixons. Wow. It is the creepiest painting of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Uh, for people who don't know who John Dean is, he was... I don't know who John Dean is. Oh, uh, John Dean was Nixon's was attorney. Oh, okay. Uh, he wasn't deep throat, but he was one of the ones that blew it all up. Um, and yeah, he went to jail. That's pretty wild. <laughs> uh, and Maureen Dean, I think. Uh, so he, he was uh, the brother of my aunt by marriage, so... Uh, but that's like the only cool thing I'm related to is the Watergate scandal by marriage. That's pretty wild. Yeah. That is pretty wild. That had nothing to do with Kennedy, but... That had nothing to do with Kennedy, but that's okay, <laughs> man. It all ties in. It yeah. all ties in. And Kennedy was super gross. And he was super gross. There you go. <laughs> staying with the Kennedy thing and staying with gun stuff. Uh, the Bobby Kennedy assassination was supposedly done with the, what, a nine-shot 22 revolver? You know, I don't actually know. I literally have not done anything with Bobby Kennedy. Okay. Um, but there were, uh... I know his shirt was on display at the LA Police Museum for a while. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not sure. I know that that Carcano rifle was really stupid. Uh, it was just a military surplus that he ordered in a catalog. Right, you know. Um, I, I, so one of the he picked it up under, a, under an alias. Oh, so he lied? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I mean, it was like he picked it up in a mailbox. It was different times. 
right? I always tell people when I teach gun classes, I always tell people that um, uh, we can't, I said, uh, you know, when the president comes out and says, well, it's easier to get a library card than it is to get a gun. I, I think said, that was like, I don't think it was president, I think that was like a congresswoman or something. No, Obama said one, this. Yeah. Oh, okay. Obama I think you're talking about like that was literally. My best Obama voice. Literally, somebody just said this again. So okay. that's my bad. You almost got us hit. You were so excited. <laughs> I was. <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I always tell people, I, you know, when when people come out and say you can get a gun in the mail, I always say, Lee Harvey Oswald ruined that for yeah. us. Right. Uh, I guess yeah, I never thought about it that way, but it did. yeah, that's I get such a. I wrote a whole article on that gun. Um, I like the... So, all right, so you wrote a hard article, so we're not going to ask you if you're an expert because we know that you might be knowledgeable. We might say you're an expert. But I wouldn't. Honestly, I don't even remember the article that much. It was a couple years ago, but uh, <laughs> I remember like, tra like that it's very easy to track um, because there was like, an advertisement. that and a catalog. Yeah, like, so they're, they're, like, it's actually very well documented, which is pretty neat. You don't see that a lot. Could that rifle handle firing all three shots? I feel like I need to know far more about the conspiracy okay. to know that, but right. well, I mean, like, it was sure? some, some of it is that um, <laughs> I feel like heard... he wasn't, uh, that Oswald wasn't a good marksman. But see, I um, think that that's, there's also a lot of evidence that says that's not true. Right. He's an avid marksman. Right. And I've seen, way before your time in doing shows on the History Channel and, and, uh, and whatnot, um, you'd see these guys that, like, they position themselves six stories up on a fire truck or whatever, right? So they're up that high and they try to shoot something and, and uh, it always seems like they can. And some guys say that they can't. And yeah. I don't know. This, I don't know. This is why I dig it. I, I have no idea if he was happen. capable of that. But I did, I mean, I remember reading that, that, that a lot of people thought he was a really good marksman. So, right. I don't know. You know what I think is weird? Lee Harvey Oswald, John Wilkes Booth, why they got three names. That's a good conspiracy theory. That is. If you go by all three of your names, there's you a real might, good chance you're you, going to be an assassin. Yeah, <laughs> you might kill a president. Did you? <laughs> did you hear? Um, James Earl Jones went to get an award, and the award they knew there were three names, and they uh, they put Lee Harvey Oswald as the no. Who's the guy that shot uh, um, Martin Luther <laughs> King? Uh, yeah, James Earl Ray. James Earl Ray. Uh, oh, so, my God. Yeah, so ah. James Earl Jones was going to get an award someplace, and someone put James Earl Ray uh, on the award. That's not good. He's like Darth Vader, wasn't he, though? Like, he, he's not like Darth Vader. He was, well, he, he was the voice. Dar he, was, he, was he was the voice. So, he, yes, he was. But, I I mean, like, you'd think that you wouldn't want to fuck with Darth Vader, right? Uh, yeah. Because like, the force is strong with him. Yeah, he, like, he just, like, everybody yeah, just dropped out for strangulation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> This is pretty. This that's is so bad. James Earl Ray, like, yeah. What? Like, oh, that's bad. That is, that is a that bad. Is a bad. Is a Freudian slip? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it counts. If that constitutes. But that's pretty bad. Yeah, I've never heard that. Really bad. Really bad. Was he a good sport? Was he like, no, I want this one? <laughs> He's like, <laughs> he was like. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's horrible. <laughs> I mean, uh, need bigger lungs. That's bad. That's bright. That's it. The, uh, I don't know if you know, the, the, I'm, I used to be a Star Wars geek. Yeah. Um, and then I, you know, got, I had kids, became an adult. Yeah. And then I made my son watch Star Wars movies. Um, but James Earl Jones was, uh, even though he did the voice, he did the voice of Darth Vader, he was, uh, he was just, like, for the first Star Wars movie, he was just the special effects guy. Oh, really? Yeah. So I started laughing because I was thinking again, like, why he couldn't actually be Darth Vader. And I think my, like, dad, like, the person was, like, because, you know, he was black, so, like, when they pulled off the mask, um, <laughs> that, could, that could be a problem. That could be a problem. But, Somebody, somebody's but got some explaining to do. I'm pretty sure that, like, you know, I when they took, the, like, the, the helmet off, like, I wouldn't have assumed that Luke's dad was, like, an egg either, but, like, that's what he looked like. So, I mean, this he could have done true. some stuff. Like, <laughs> if you see, this is completely ridiculous. Have you seen that meme of Billy Joel with the, uh, the harmonica? 
No, and I love Billy Joel. So, so there's this picture. There's this picture of, of Billy Joel, and you know he's been sporting the shaved head for quite a while, uh, and he's got the the thing that holds a harmonica, and he's got the. Oh, now I can get where this goes. Yes, exactly. We'll have to put a picture in there of this. It's a picture of uh, they're like you know little did we know that uh, Darth Vader was really Billy Joel. Or <laughs> he would like look that. like that. Oh, that's yeah. That's good. I love Billy Joel. Yeah, he's, he's pretty awesome. I mean, like I guess he's political now, but I just think. I, I'm like probably one of his biggest fans. Mm. I went to my first Billy Joel concert a couple of years ago and I was so disappointed. Uh, uh, mainly because, like, because now, you know, he's old, right. drugs have done him in, uh, he's phoning it in, you know, so like, you know, all he's, of the hits, I actually don't really like the hits. Yeah. Like, uh, so, you know, like, and, and he would do uh, in the show, he'd be like, all right, I'm going to give you a choice, you know, stiletto or she's always a woman. And I'd be like, stiletto! You know, and like, of course he plays She's Always a Woman. Right. And so, to me, it was a little dis disappointing because, like, I think some of his greatest works like, aren't things that you hear regularly. Right. And I uh, like Slow It's a great song. Um, I like it because I like high heels. But, and that's why I love when Sirius has the Billy Joel channel. Like, mm. can't get enough of that. Um, but yeah, I was really disappointed. And I was like, so now, I was like, we gotta get some, like, like sometime when, like, Billy Joel's doing, like, a hipster concert, like, <laughs> at a bar, or, like, a piano bar right. or something. Like, we gotta find out where he's at, because he might actually play some other things. I heard Howard Stern was say one time that he was, you know, at a party in the Hamptons hanging and Billy Joel was there. And everybody talked Billy Joel into playing. And, of course, Howard wants to hear Piano Man, but he goes up and plays some... Have some Chopin or some Beethoven or something. And Billy Joel and Howard's like, yeah, it's not. We want to hear you play, man. But you know, Billy, he's whatever. You want so what you're saying is he's changed? I'm saying that when he when he gets a chance to play the piano, he's probably not playing his hits. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good to at least know because so. yeah, that was disappointing. I, like I, I know that's probably not a popular thought, but like I, I mean, I think Piano Man's what, like a wonderful song, but I don't like right. it that much. I'm like, ugh, this thing. There's I'd rather like we didn't start the fire if we're gonna. Right. Go there's uh there's a great one I heard. I don't know who where I heard it from, but it said uh, for a song <laughs> it said for a song titled Piano Man, the harmonic player really needs to shut the F up. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> there's a, a serious channel that he hosts sometimes. Um, he has a great descriptor of when he wrote Ballad of Billy the Kid. Yeah. Um, because it's like he it's like he goes through it and he's like, you know, kinda of singing it and like talking about it. And he's like, This the lyrics of this make no fucking sense. <laughs> <laughs> like, like he'll talk about like he'll talk about like I can't. I'm now like the words are escaping me, but like he'll talk about like um, like different locations that he's at. They're not anywhere close to where Billy the Kid actually like operated, wow. and like yeah, uh, it's fantastic. So it's like the most historically inaccurate ballad in Ode to uh, uh, a notorious figure. Right. I I heard the same thing was true about. Um, uh, Africa by Toto. Like the, all this stuff that they talked about is nowhere near anywhere near each other. And oh, really? It's a bunch of bunk. Yeah, it's just all. Awesome. I'm trying to think of the words now. I don't know. I know that 90, 99 people can do it because 100 men can't. Uh, I don't know. Some stupid All right, listen. We are back to where we need to be. This has been a lot of fun. This yeah, is, it's this been is fun. why this is why I love my show. Um, because I get to, uh, I get to hang out with cool people and go cool places. And, um, it's not, uh, not like other shows. No, it's this a is, lot of fun. Although my neck kind of hurts from like, looking at you this entire time. <laughs> well, like, don't look at me. Yeah. Play something. The last thing you want to do is look at me. All right, listen, um, I want to give you a riding shotgun with Charlie Patch and a okay. gun drum patch and a sticker. Sweet, sweet. Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. Thank I you really so appreciate much. it. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. I I love expanding my circle of friends this way. Yeah, no, so it's this great. Is, this is cool. Thank you. And then share, send on me all the photos. I will. Uh, how can people reach you? Oh shit! I'm already like on my phone. Well, oh. you're done. I was like, at least you didn't take off your seatbelt. <laughs> I was like, I'm out. How can people reach me? Um, on Instagram, I'm at History and Heels. Mm -hmm. On Facebook, I'm at Official Ashley Levinsky. You can figure out how to spell that or. You you can just follow me on Instagram. Uh, I have a Twitter. is so much easier. It's so much easier. Or I have a Twitter account. Because the H is silent. Yes. Uh, I have a Twitter account, but I think Twitter is toxic. So I just have oh it so God. somebody doesn't steal my identity. That's Good it. Call. So I don't post. So Instagram is really the place to find me. Instagram's the yeah. place. All right, cool. Awesome. All right, listen, thank you for being on the show. Thank you guys for watching this episode of Writing Shotgun with Charlie. Um, please, uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't. Um, if you are not a member of the Second Amendment Foundation, you should be. You can join the Second Amendment Foundation at saf.org. You can check out all of your 
uh, Pro Freedom Podcasts in one place at sdrn.us. That's the Self Defense Radio Network. I want to thank Cheryl Todd for letting us borrow her stagecoach. She's from Gun Freedom Radio and from the Pot of Gold Auction House. And uh, thanks for watching the show. We'll talk to you guys soon. <laughs> awesome. Easy peasy. It was fun. Done.